welcome everyone today to our next uh, webinar for the Croydoremia Research Foundation. I'm so excited that you're here. Um, we have a, a big group that's joining us today, and we are using the webinar feature. So I first of all need to apologize to all of you because my video might be pixelated. And uh, for those of you, Brent and others that have joined us on other calls um, or webinars, rather, um, I'm at home today, and typically I'm at my son's, but I'm not able to go there today. So. I'm using my audio phone and my computer for video, so thank you for your understanding on this version, but I'll be, I'll be stepping out here shortly. As I said, today we are doing the emotional aspects of vision loss, choroideremia, and how to find resiliency um, despite the hard things that we go through with vision loss. Um, I need to make sure I... Uh, share my gratitude, the Foundation's gratitude to our sponsors, Allergan and Biogen. They have sponsored all of our online webinars, so certainly want to give them a shout out and tell them thank you again. Um, we are recording this, so you'll be able to look at this or share this um, session. It will be on our website, and we'll send you out a link to that along with the survey afterwards. Um, and just again, housekeeping issues. I'm sure many of you have done this many times with Zoom, but as we are using the webinar feature, um, we are going to use the chat, chat feature. Denise is going to be presenting information. We're going to take a break about halfway through for questions, and then we'll take some more questions at the end. Um, but use that chat feature. That's my job. I'll be sharing your questions with her. And uh, just wanted to let you know, too, this is a um, two-session webinar. So we are going to be hosting the second session next Wednesday, which will um, be in the afternoon with Denise again and some of our own CHMers, near and dear to my heart, Mike McCarthy, Lynn Ogg, and John Trott. And uh, we will be doing a potential evening one as well, depending on some work schedules. We're just trying to still nail that out. Um, but we'll make sure we let you know, and it's more of a hands-on um, dialogue chat about how we all deal with these issues of, of loss and coping with that. So all that to say, I'll stop talking here shortly. Um, we are very honored. I'm honored and very grateful to Denise Bondi, who is um, joining us today. She is a licensed clinical social worker. And she lives up in Rochester, and I'm hoping that we're going to be meeting her personally um, next year at our conference. So, Denise, I again, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, we look forward to everything that you have to share with us. And I'm going to um, stop my video and put me on mute, and you'll be able to screen share. Okay, Beth, is it okay if I also record for my end? Sure. Um, yeah, or I'll, I can send you um, the recording either way. I'm not sure how that would work, but. Yeah, me neither. So if it's okay for me to also record, I, I'd like to do that. So hopefully I won't mess anything up and um, I will work on sharing my screen here. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm assuming, let me, please let me know, send me a chat if people can't hear me. It is very nice to be here today. Um, again, my name is Denise Bondi, and I am a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm also a PhD student at the Department of Counseling and Human Development at the University of Rochester. And currently I'm working on a project um, called Project Rebuild, which is for older adults with vision loss. Um, so that's how I became involved um, with this webinar today. So it's really nice to be here today. And 
I'm hoping that um, I'll get to talk to you more one-to-one um, -one in our next session. Okay, so just a little introduction about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, today we're going to talk about some common emotions with vision loss, ways to prevent or reduce negative emotions, as well as some resilience building strategies. Okay, so you might have a variety of thoughts and feelings about your diagnosis. And probably um, many people here have heard about um, feelings um, associated with grief, but I just wanted to kind of touch on them today um, in case you haven't or to validate feelings that you, that you may have, um, as well as um, for significant others um, to be able to understand um, some things that might be going on with people you love who may have vision loss. Um, so, um, similar to other types of loss, uh, people with vision loss frequently go through a grief process, okay? And here are some common feelings um, associated with that. Denial um, or shock, which is the belief, the feeling that, boy, this isn't really happening. Anger, uh, anger is very common and normal, um, might be angry at God, frustrated with doctors, irritable with the people that you care about. Bargaining, you, um, you may try to bargain with God or pursue fringe or sham treatments. Uh, many times along with loss or sadness or disappointment at having to change one's plans or expectations because things didn't go exactly the way that you had planned. Isolation. Um, many people that are going through any kind of loss um, feel like no one can understand them. And the hope is that as people grieve that they will ultimately um, reach some level of acceptance, um, which means moving forward and adjusting to one's um, diagnosis. You know, one thing I just want to kind of mention is that there's no right way to grieve, right? Um, your reactions might fluctuate. You may feel at peace with your diagnosis one day and then the next day feel angry. Um, if your vision continues to worsen, grief can be continuous. Uh, and I guess I just want to say that any feelings that you may have or you may have as, as the, um, the significant other um, are normal and okay. And there's no, again, there's not, this doesn't occur in a step-by-step -step kind of process. These are just some feelings that, um, you know, that you might have. So one thing I just want to touch on is, you know, what can you do if you feel stuck in your grief? Uh, a lot of times self-help groups are very helpful for that. They really help people to, to move along um, and not feel so stuck. And also I just want to um, say that um, counseling a lot of times is very helpful for people. Um, nowadays, lots and lots of people go to counseling for a lot of different reasons and it can be very helpful. Okay, so I just want to talk about um, depression by disease. So as you see, um, visual impairment um, research says that about 30% of people with a visual impairment have some symptoms of depression. And that's higher, that's higher than lung cancer, diabetes, heart failure, and COPD. So people um, with visual impairment are at risk of feeling depressed. And also in primary care settings, depression is really underdiagnosed. A lot of times people, um, doctors don't detect that. So this is an interesting way of looking at, um, this is like one model, one way of looking at the effects of vision loss on mood. Okay, so a person has vision loss and the, this person would, vision loss may do less 
and the less they do, the worse they feel. And the worse they feel, the less they do, and the more they worry. So it becomes this kind of downward spiral, right? Where the worse you feel, the less you do, the less you do, the worse you feel. So now I want to spend um, really the, re the remainder of today's webinar talking about ways to intervene or prevent this downward spiral and to promote resilience. So I want to start out with a definition. There's several definitions. Um, they're pretty similar though, but I really like this definition of resilience, which is adapting well or bouncing back from adversity, stress, or difficult experiences. Many believe that resilience can be developed. Um, so that's good news. The amount of resilience you have today isn't, you're not necessarily, it's not a fixed amount. You're not necessarily stuck with that amount of resilience. You can do things to increase your resilience. So I want to talk about some ways to cope with vision loss and build resilience. Um, number one, educating yourself. Number two, working on assertiveness skills. Number three, evaluating your attitudes about accepting help. And number four, continuing, um, consider, I'm sorry, considering um, contributing to others. So let's talk first a little bit about um, educating yourself. Um, and family and friends, okay? So knowledge is power, right? And self-awareness facilitates adaption, okay? The more that we're aware of our strengths and limitations, the more likely one is to use assistive devices, okay? This helps people with vision impairments um, to adapt and as we talked about, adaption is important um, in resilience. And also um, educating others helps them to develop real expectations. Um, if you're a significant other, it's helpful to know what you can ask, what you can ask um, for help with and how you can assist your loved one. Okay, it's also important to work on your assertiveness skills. Speaking up for your needs and setting limits um, helps with interpersonal effectiveness, okay? And the more effectively we can relate to others, the higher our well-being and the lower our level of depression. Also, um, I think this is an important one. Evaluate your efforts about accepting help. We live in a country that stresses autonomy and individualism, yet we're social beings and we're meant to be independent, interdependent on each other. And many of us will need to be dependent on others at some point in our life. Um, I got this quote right here from the internet, I liked it. Um, it says, be strong enough to stand alone, smart enough to know when you need help, and brave enough to ask for it. I think sometimes asking for help takes courage. Also, um, significant others and friends often want to help, and allowing others to help can improve can improve your relationship with them. People want to people want to do something to help, and it makes them feel better if they can if they can do something rather than feel helpless. Okay, and even if we accept help, we can still contribute to others. Research indicates that helping others can decrease depression. Um, and the reason why is because when we're depressed, we're kind of inside ourselves in a bubble. And um, when we help others, it helps us to go outside our bubble. And for many people, it helps to improve their mood. I just like, I, this is another quote that I got off the internet, no act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. And it doesn't have to be huge. It could be smiling at somebody. It could be listening to somebody. It could be showing patience to the 
um, person in the store who made a mistake, um, those kinds of things. And um, it's a win-win situation that helps others and it helps us to, it helps uh, lift us out of our depression. Okay, I, I put this slide up because I just wanted to um, remind myself to stop and see if anybody has any questions or comments at this point. We can maybe stop at another point too. If, you know. <laughs> I don't have anybody yet that has used that chat feature, Denise, and okay. um, maybe some of the fast typer, they can do it right now. <laughs> Otherwise, um, maybe we can stop in, in some screens and I'll, I'll uh, make sure I let you know. Okay, yeah, yeah, maybe um, either I'll think of it or Beth, you can give me a reminder, that'd be great, thank you. Okay, we'll continue to go forward. So I want to talk about more ways to build resilience. I want to um, at least touch on, I know you guys have had workshops on this already, but I want to brief, um, briefly touch on services. Um, I want to talk about social connectedness, and then I want to talk about coping skills. Services I want to talk about are use of visual aids, visual rehabilitation, and project rebuild, which is a project that I'm involved with at the University of Rochester. So social being um, was determined to be higher among individuals with vision loss who use visual aids, especially electronic aids. Okay. And I think the reason why is because use of visual aids indicates that a person is adapting to their vision loss. And again, adaption is part of the definition of resilience, right? The more we can adapt, the more we can bounce back from adversity. So um, vision rehabilitation, um, I think Beth said that some people um, that are members of your group um, go for vision rehabilitation. Um, I'm in New York State, so things may be very different and, you know, from wherever you're tuning in from. But um, anyways, um, vision rehabilitation can help you achieve your functioning goals. They can assess your remaining vision and they can help develop, help you to develop skills for everyday functioning. And here are some examples that vision rehabilitation um, can help you with. Cooking safely, safe travel, taking care of your home, um, enjoying leisure activities. You know, it's, it's really important to continue to try to find um, ways to do the things that you enjoy, such as how, how to use um, self-threading needles. Okay, or they can help you to feel more confident about vision devices that you might be using. It's recommended that you get visual rehabilitation as early as you can or whenever you have a new decline in your vision. Again, as I said, I'm in New York State and it is covered in New York State if you are legally blind. I really don't know about other states. And also your eye doctor can make a referral. So I just want to talk a little bit about the project that I'm involved in and um, called Project Rebuild, which stands for Resilience Building Intervention to Prevent Late Life Depression with Vision Loss. And it is a free program for older adults age 55 and over with vision loss. And um, Sometimes they will work, um, the principal told me that sometimes they will work with people as low as age 50, but generally it's for age 55 and over. And um, it helps to build resilience for people that are affected by vision loss um, and um, if the vision can't be corrected. And it includes four classes and six one-to-one -one sessions. And the classes, um, these are the nature of the classes, causes of vision loss, orientation, mobility, adaptions in the home, and emotional adjustment to vision. They used to be delivered at the ABVI, the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired in Rochester, New York, with transportation provided. 
but now because of COVID, they will be remote. And that's why I wanted to let you know about this because, um, because everything will be remote now, we'll be able to open it up to people who are not local. And my role in this project is I am a resilience building coach. So that's the second part of the program, which is you get six resilience building sessions. Um, where you talk about um, defining problems, um, generate brainstorming solutions, um, discussing pros and cons of different solutions, and um, the resilience coach helps you come up with an action plan and coaches you um, to move forward. So that's the, the kind of work that I'm doing with the um, project. And here's a number. I'm just going to flash it on the screen for a minute in case anybody is interested. It's an area code 585, okay? And these are the people who are involved in the project. Maybe we yeah. should, so Denise, maybe we should just say that number right now. And is that something that even though people live outside of Rochester and live outside of New York, is this something that they can pursue to get that one-on-one -on -one coaching? Yes. Um, now, I've been doing the coaching. I actually would prefer if people had um, capability, I would prefer to do it via Zoom because I think it's better to do it that way. But so far, the older adults that I've been working with, they've all wanted to do it via over the phone. Um, so, and we have like a binder that we locally that we give to people, but we might um, either find a way to mail the binder or maybe put it, you know, put it on like PDF files and send it um, via the internet. But yes, because we're doing everything remotely now, it used to be home visits, the uh, um, resilience coaching, but because we're doing everything remotely now, we can open it up to others. We have a question, Denise, from Brent, who asks if, it asks if there's any requirements or prerequisites to join or to participate. And is it free or is it paid for by insurance? It is, it is free and um, insurance does not need to pay for it. We have a grant by the um, Greater Health um, Association that pays for it. The grant, we thought that it was going to end um, um, last year and then this year, but we still have money left. So it's, it's free. Um, the only requirement is um, really age 55 and older and um, not living in a nursing home and um, assisted living is okay, and probably um, um, not with dementia because there's things that you need to remember. Um, I, I think you need the um, capacities. Um, so th those are the exclusion criteria. But other than that, um, and um, Sylvie also said that if you are, they might go as low as age 50. And what happens if you're a youngster, unlike me, uh, that is younger than 50, what would you suggest? Or do you know of any programs that are like this for younger people? Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't. I don't know any programs like this for, um, for younger people. Um, I can ask um, Dr. Sorensen, and actually I'll send her an email uh, between this week and next, and I'll let you know if she's aware of any. Um, I just, well, originally this program was developed for people um, with macular degeneration, which is very much an age-related kind of vision loss. Um, so, um, you know, that's why it was developed for the older adults. If I think of anything or if I hear of anything, I'll let you know next time. Perfect. And meanwhile, Denise, is it okay? I know there's a couple more questions regarding specific age-related, um, is it okay if we go ahead and call and ask for you at the 585-371-8173 number? Well, um, the, the person that you would, that the person that you would speak with is Kate, who is a program coordinator. Kate? Um, but, but sure, if somebody wants to reach me specifically to ask me a question, um, you know, you can also, you know, like leave a message at this number. To, to Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. 
but um, yeah, the person that um, I'll just show, I'll just put my um, pointer on. This is Kate, who's a coordinator. Um, she's a person that will field the calls and refer them accordingly. And this person here, Dr. Sorensen, she's the she's a big cheese. She's the one that got the grant and and um, it, she's actually the person that asked me to do this presentation too. Okay. Anything else right now or? We can move on. Okay. All right. Great. Well, you know what? I'm, just, I'm going to, Wayne, we have a caller from the UK. Um, Wayne is just making a comment here. Let me share that with the group. Um, the problem is the same here in the UK. There are a lot of services for the young and the old, but it's so hard to access support between 20 and 60. And you know, I, I appreciate that, Wayne, so much. And as as I was listening to Denise talking, I'm wondering if there's the ability for our organization. I know Kathy's on the line, our executive director, and so is Neil and his wife, Jeanette. And um, <laughs> I'm opening my mouth, but I'm wondering if that's something that we might be able to provide to our, you know, to our CHM uh, foundation family. So I'm going to write that down and follow up on that because that's really a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll I'll go back and and just mention that you know I mean as um, I I know Dr. Sorensen she was actually trying to write a grant to to translate it to Spanish to work with Spanish speaking people, but. Um, and really kind of her specialty is working with older adults, but um, I still just go back and say that. I mean, you're, you're talking about a need that, you know, perhaps somebody can help meet that need. Even more so now with this, you know, COVID situation, people are more isolated and even need more of that nowadays than perhaps they had to had need for in the past so right yeah that is a whole nother layer of um, stress and sadness to everything right yeah okay um, anything else or should I move forward I think we can move forward okay, okay so um, this is a Another thing that is really, really important for um, increasing well-being and resilience, and that is um, social connectedness. And now more than ever, right, during this COVID, when many of us are isolated, are, are we really realizing like how important it is to be socially connected, right? And there's a lot of research about social connectedness. It's a kind of a research interest of mine. Um, and it helps, um, being connected socially helps to prevent or decrease to, um, depression, recover from illness, and adapt to vision loss. There's even research that relates it to mortality, higher mortality um, among people who are socially isolated. So how can we connect socially? Um, as you guys probably know, um, seeking out support from family, friends, community organizations. Um, I'm working with a lot of older adults who really um, get a lot of connectedness through their churches um, or religious organizations. And I also want to talk about um, self-help groups. Self-help groups can provide emotional support social contact and recreation, sharing and normalizing feelings, information, and some involve partners or family members. Uh, I've run some groups in my life. I used to work for a partial hospitalization program um, with people, um, you know, that were coming out of the um, hospital. And I just feel like sometimes there is nothing like being around other people who are going through the same thing you're going through. You know, many times um, people, whatever they're going through, feel like only people that are going through the same thing can truly understand them. Um, so I just, I've, I've seen the healing power of groups. And um, so I highly recommend them. You know, because it, you, people are from all over the place, I can't really tell you about what are some self-help groups in your area. But they, I was informed that there is a Facebook group, a CRF Facebook group, 
And also, I found this number on the internet. It's a national number, which you could start with also. Um, for, uh, for us locally in Rochester, we have something called Lifeline, where you call. I always use it as a social worker. If I need resources, I call them and I say, you know, what's a resource, you know, for this individual? And they always have lots of resources. So hopefully you would, you all would have local resources like that you, that you could call and find out your local self-help groups. Okay, now before we talk about um, coping um, skills, and uh, any other questions that we um, that I should address, or should I go forward? Well, let me see. There's two 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 questions. So, okay. if going back to that slide, Denise, where it has the arrows with the vision loss and getting out of the pattern of hopelessness and thinking patterns. You gave us some suggestions, and one of which is to help others, kind of getting the focus off ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so easy, especially when you don't see well, right, just to get in your own head so much. Yes. And with thinking it's a behavior that it's a learned behavior with time. So do you have any, you know, specific suggestions or ideas um, on how to do that with folks with low vision? how folks with low vision can um, help others, contribute to others in some way? I Is think help and, and probably get out of that um, thinking, that th the behavior of thinking mode. Yeah, well, I, I actually think uh, we're going to talk about more about this. Um, we're going to talk about more strategies going forward, but I think everything that we've talked about thus far can be helpful. And is, as I'm saying on this slide, Different coping skills work with different people. One side doesn't. One size does not fit all. Okay, so contributing to others may not be your thing. That might not be helpful for you, um, but it might be helpful for others. Okay, um, but anything, all the things that we were talking about, join. You know, joining a support group. You know, um, um, you know, getting. Um, you know, getting assessments on your vision, um, trying to use um, adaptive devices, all those things are taking action, right? And, and taking any kind of action helps to get you out of that downward spiral. And what action is helpful for you is individual to you. It's gonna depend on you and what works for you. I think that answers the question. Okay. And we're going to talk about more things that um, um, right now. We're going to talk about more strategies. Okay. So I really wanted to put in a plug for exercising. Okay. Um, first of all, as we as we're talking about with other things, exercise is activating, right? So again, you're taking action and you're getting out of that um, downward spiral of doing less. And Research shows that aerobic exercise decreases anxiety and depression. Aerobic exercise meaning that you do something to get your heart pumping for at least 20 minutes. There's a lot of research that it helps. And I, I, I think it's probably, again, because you're taking action. And um, I think people are wondering if there's some kind of, you know, um, th something that goes on in your brain when you exercise that lifts you out of your anxiety and depression. Okay, um, another co coping skill, this is important. This is, we, we talk about this in, um, in our um, resilience building um, project too, is scheduling time for pleasurable activities. Okay, whatever, whatever that might be. And that's why it's important sometimes to get the visual um, rehabilitation um, assessment because sometimes they can help you make adaptions so that you can still do the pleasurable activities that you enjoy such as self-threading needles or books on tape or things like that. Um, okay this one called reframing is focusing on the positive aspects of your situation. I don't know if uh, I'll, I don't know if everybody can see this um, this these images, but there's um, th there's two glasses, right? And 
are the glasses half full or half empty, right? So reframing is a way of trying to see the glass is half full, okay? So here's an example. Um, people talk, we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? I hear some people saying that one good thing that's coming out of this is that it gives us an opportunity to spend more time with people that we care about. That's an example of a reframe. Um, for some people, that's very, very helpful. Okay. Um, similar to the idea of reframing is the idea of um, focusing on your abilities and strengths rather than only on your limitations. And also, um, even though experts believe that it's important to accept um, your identity as a person with vision loss, that that's going to help you adapt, right, and be resilient, consider that this is only part of your identity. You are so much more than a person with vision loss. And sometimes just taking that perspective, that bigger picture perspective is, is very helpful for people. So for some people, um, downward comparison, comparing yourself um, someone who has, who is worse off, for some people that's very helpful. Humor, you know, again, not everything works for everybody. Um, I come from a very jokey family that, that likes to joke around all the time. Um, just to share with you, my dad, he um, had a stroke behind one of his eyes. He had a stroke in his optic nerve, so he lost sight in one of his eyes. And he's always making jokes about um, only being able to see out of one eye. Again, that's, um, that's a very individual thing. For him, that's a good coping skill. It may not be for, you know, other people. Again, um, seeking help and support from others, that is a very, very important um, coping skill. You know, again, where we need each other, we're social beings, we're in interdependent, and it's very important um, to be able to seek help and support from other people. Okay, um, this one, expressing gratitude, is, um, some is very, very helpful. Um, so an example of expressing gratitude might be in the morning or at night, writing down or just thinking about or discussing, you know, with your significant other, three things or one thing or however many things that you're grateful for. Um, so the idea of expressing gratitude gets, again, gets you thinking into that positive thinking mode, like, you know, there's always things to be grateful for. And if we focus on them, a lot of times that can help our mood and, and again, get us out of that downward negative spiral. And, um, you know, finally, this is a quote that I got off the internet. I think it's a really good metaphor for resilience. Um, and it says, she stood in the storm and the, when the wind did not blow her way, she adjusted her sails. I've seen that before, and I just found that off the, um, on the internet. And to me, that's exactly what resilience is, right? Um, you know, we have adversity or storm or stress or negativity in our lives. And, and you know, many times things don't go the way we had planned. Um, but when we can adjust our sails or adapt, that is, that is a definition of resilience. And that is it. That is all of my presentation. I'm hoping that maybe we have a few more questions or comments. Let's see if we do. Um, we have, let's just see a second. I have a comment that came in. Let me see. From one of our, one of our attendees, they said, um, it's a two-parter. They said, can you speak of your awareness of suicide related to vision loss, like feelings of loss, worthlessness, anxiety, becoming a burden of loved ones, or burden to loved ones? And then um, he followed up with, 
support groups helped me overcome that feeling, and I'm so much happier and more confident. And to your point, exactly what you said, Denise, he said, I am the same person. I just don't simply see as well as I used to. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, 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 okay, so yeah, it sounds like you're, you, you're saying a lot of things here, but yes, you, you're defined, you know, you realize you are, you are a whole person with, and there's many, many aspects to you and you have vision loss on top of, you know, on top of everything else. And yes, you're also speaking about, um, you know, firsthand how helpful support groups can be. Uh, I'm telling you, I've seen, I, I actually even, I had to take a group um, counseling class in my PhD program and, you know, we all got to even experience, you know, like what it was like, the healing aspects of being in a group setting, because again, we're social beings, you know, and, and it, it's just very healing to have other people in the um, same situation that we're, you know, that, that we are in. Um, I, I don't know the statistics about suicide um, related to individuals with, uh, with vision loss, but that's a really important, now I'm curious, right? Um, I know, um, you know, it's higher among um, adults and, they're, they're, and it's higher among people who are depressed. So it makes sense that that, that might be a risk, you know, for people who are depressed from vision loss or any other reason. I think, you know, I am a, a carrier. I have a father with choroideremia. I have two sons that have choroideremia that have been diagnosed with it and are in their 20s. Um, and, you know, there, you touched on a lot of things that I know ha we've talked about, um, just anxiety, sadness, um, worthlessness, some of those other things. Um, it shouldn't be overshadowed, and I am so glad that you spoke so much about resiliency and coping mechanisms. And um, I'm, I'm super excited because our second session that we're going to have next week is going to specifically deal, we're going to have, again, as I said, three folks with choroideremia, the gentleman that I listed. Um, they're going to talk for maybe five minutes or so a piece about one or two things that they've really struggled with, you know, in terms of vision loss and not minimizing the challenge that comes with it, but how did they specifically kind of walk through it or maybe, and they still, they still really could be doing so now, but how did they overcome, you know, what tools do each of us have in our toolbox Mm -hmm. um, to be able to apply when those hard times comes. And one of those things about, about vision loss, it's so easy to say because I have choroideremia, I'm bummed out or I'm sad or I'm overwhelmed, but it certainly is with people just in general, right? In general, it doesn't have to be people with vision loss. Right. Yes. Corey, yeah, of course. Hey, Corey. Um, and he's sharing a comment here that I'll share with the group. The CRS came about due to people joining a support group and deciding to do something to help CHMers. And it's quite empowering to grab the bull by the horns. Amen. I would agree. Right. Yeah. You know, we do have a lot of spouses on here too, Denise, or partners um, that are here representing their families and, and a couple couples that are sitting together. And I think, do you have anything to say specifically to those, the spouses? Because, you know, we love, we love our husbands and our, um, you know, our family members very, very much. And as we want to walk through this with them, is there anything that, you know, when you have it, as, if I could ask this, you know, as you see perhaps a spouse or somebody that you sh you can see is struggling, are there any really good um, cues or questions that we can ask them without them necessarily feeling threatened? You know, is there any good open-ended question that you've seen that work well? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Um, I I think just a really good question is, um, you know, is there anything that I can do to help? you know, how can I help you? And, and um, sometimes just listening, um, 
you know, sometimes there, there is nothing you, you can do. All you can do is listen. And I, and my guess is that significant others go through the same grief process, right? Um, this is just as hard. This is just as hard on them, right? You know, because um, it affects your hope and dreams too. And we don't like to see the, um, you know, the people we love going through a hard time. So it, it affects us just as much. So, you know, the other thing I would say is um, it's okay to, to get help and support for yourself too. It, it, in fact, it's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree too. Let's see if anybody else has come up with any other, any other chats here, any other comments. Now is the time, everybody. <laughs> we have a pretty full group here, but kind of quiet. Well, here's a new message. Let's see. This is from Lynn Og, who will be joining us next week. Um, oops. <laughs> Lynn's comment. Excuse me, everybody. He's learning the uh, he's learning the good things about Zoom, and so he had a technical question. Hey, Lynn. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Well. I, I had to have a crash course in Zoom. I was um, I was teaching a course this spring and and um, in person and it was through this pandemic. They're like, guess what? You're going to teach via Zoom the rest of the semester. <laughs> so, hey, we did have another, to learn. we have another question from someone. It says, can you talk a little bit more about um, let's see, being a burden? How to address that with a loved one? Feeling like the oh, okay, so it, like feeling like the loved one thinks we're a burden. And in actuality, this is my thought. The actuality, they probably don't think that you're a burden at all. But it's you know the, the person with vision loss thinks they're a burden on mm -hmm. their loved one. Mm -hmm. You know how best can we address that with them? Um, well, the, I, you know I I've worked with people you know who have felt a, a, like a burden in a lot of different ways and I always kind of challenge that you know I, I, I feel like you're I feel like you can do a lot just because you have vision loss it doesn't mean you can't contribute in some way in, in that relationship I mean you can contribute by listening I mean um, you know your significant other likes to come home and talk to you every day about their day I mean don't underestimate um, and I guess as a significant other, I would say, you know, to say that to your loved one, you know, don't un underestimate the the contributions that you are making. You know, it's not like you're not making any contributions at all. So, um, you know, I, I guess I, I would just encourage the couple to explore what contributions, you know, that person can make. I think that's a great comment, Denise. And, and you know, as a daughter of a, a a gentleman who was losing his vision, I will tell you that, that he was the best listener and the best father I could possibly have because he was so very intent on meeting my emotional needs. And, you know, girls, you know, we talk, 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 talk. But it, that father role being so very specific, um, we have a very close relationship. And um, mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was incredible. He, he was a great father. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, and then a chance that I got to drive early and uh, had more time with him actually than my mom, which in the teenage years my mom probably thought was a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, again, right, so focus on the aspects, you know, the ways that you can contribute. There's always ways you can contribute. Well, we don't have any. I'm going to give it like one more minute, folks. Um, okay, here's another one. What are the best ways to address the loss of independence that is associated with sight loss? The best ways to address loss of independence. The loss mm. of independence that's associated. I have to think about that. The best ways to address loss of independence. Um, you know, I, I guess I, you know, it's, it, it's hard, right? It's, um, I, I think it's a grief process, right? To, to lose your independence. Um, 
but you know maybe focus on you know focus on what you can do right um you know um there there are there are some things that you can do even if you are dependent on others right I think that might be the best way off the top of my head. I'm going to think about that one a little bit more, too. That's Between one that we can talk about next week, too, Denise. I, I think that yeah. one thing, Mike McCarthy um, is going to be joining us next week, and he works at the VA, and he has choroideremia. Um, and I think that, you know, a vision specialist or rehab specialist or somebody that can come to your home and work with you or work with you and your spouse can definitely help with those things. I know my, I know friends of mine have done that who have choroideremia or vision issues. They've had to meet because independence is so important um, that they have, they wanted to remain independent. So they've had people come to help them learn how mm -hmm. to do so. Mm -hmm. How to remain independent as much as they can, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's again, you know, like the idea of adaption, right? Um, using what resources you have to do the best that you can. You know, Diana, I know this young lady who is asking this question, um, <laughs> and uh, she and I were in a group recently together, and this is a mom, a mother of someone who has uh, choroideremia or a child in this family. Do you see it any different, the coping strategies or accepting strategies for dealing with already existing vision loss Okay, let me make sure I'm reading. I'm going to read this exactly as she typed it. Mm -hmm. Do you see it any differently, the coping strategies or accepting strategies for dealing with already existing vision loss than dealing with what might come in the future? So, it is, so is it any different, the recommendations of dealing with the uncertainty? So this is a probably this is a, a mom of a young of a young child, and as you see people, you know that have choroideremia, their vision is deteriorating. Our minds very easily, as moms, can go into that that fear factor big time about how do we manage this fear of the uncertainty of what the future will hold. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, I was, it, it's interesting, um, this last weekend I was worrying about something and my husband stopped me and said, he, and said, Denise, stop with the what ifs, <laughs> you know, like it's not helpful to go with the what ifs. I mean, it's, I, 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 you know, I suppose it, it's a balance between that and planning for your future, you know, like if you know that something is, is definitely going to happen, so, um, it, you know, you get as much information as you can to, to have a good plan, right? Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're just worrying, you know, like ruminating, um, you know, the, there's mm -hmm. some strategies for that. That's, um, you know, like um, a um, uh, kind of therapy they call dialectic behavior therapy. Um, there's, they talk about, you know, trying to distract yourself, like from the worrying, right? If that's what you're talking about, you know, like worrying that maybe is not helpful. Um, so anything to distract yourself from the worrying um, is a good thing, you know, because, um, you know, again, there's a difference between planning for your future and worrying, right? That's true. If it's worrying, I say, um, do something, you know, kind of say to yourself, this isn't helpful, and do some things to distract yourself, whether that be, you know, positive activities, you know, watching something on TV, reading a book, you know, something that will take your mind away from it. Right. And, you know, in, in our organization with um being a mom and being a queen of warrior, that's kind of been one of my things that I've struggled with throughout the years. And, um, we have in the last 10 years, there are so many incredible things through gene therapy and other science that, that the foundation is, is progressing on that there is a great deal of hope um, for, for our people um, and that if we can keep our minds there and, you know, in terms of dealing with fear and worry, it, it's, it's a learned behavior, right? I mean, it's something that you have to take practice at and it, it takes a while to retrain your thinking about how to stay 
stay in the right zone when it comes with worrying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's um that's a really good point about um Beth about the hope. You know, um, it, hope is a good thing, right? And it, and it's um and things progress in science every day. James said that um, my mother felt guilty for the longest time because I have choroideremia. Have you had dealing with guilty moms? Well, James or Jim, I'm not sure which one. <laughs> she would fit right in with our group. So <laughs> we have four groups of moms um, and how we can, you know, how we can get out of that because we can't be helpful and be good moms um, if we're stuck in that. Too yeah. Early. Yeah, I've dealt with that a lot and, you know, in my counsel for different reasons. I mean, um, moms love to take the blame for a lot of things. <laughs> That's one, and I'm a mom myself, so I get it, you know. Um, um, and, and maybe I think a really good way to deal with that is getting support with each other, you know, because it helps to talk to others that say, yeah, you know, I felt the same way, but... You know, I mean, it's not your fault. You know, I mean, you know, what what could you have done differently? We have another question here. I want to make sure we get these all answered and uh, they're coming in. <laughs> um, how to get beyond the frustrations of family members to accept assistance like cane usage. It's hard on the family members when someone necessarily doesn't want to use a cane. Mm -hmm. um, but the family's saying, man, they really need they really need help with this, and I wish I could get them to start using it. Do you have any good like bullet points or things that discussion points that a family can have with their loved one? No, you know, I just feel like I've I've heard of that. I've heard of that, you know, and I've talked to people that don't want to use that too. Um, it's a it's a process for people, and it's so so hard to see when you know that it would when you know that it would help them, but. Um, you know, it's, I think it's maybe a little bit of the denial aspect, right? You know, or, um, you know, people sometimes feel, I, I guess to try to understand it too, you know, people feel like, you know, once I start, you know, once I start using a cane, you know, what does it say about me? What are people going to think about me? Um, those kinds of things, um, you know, maybe they want to stay independent as long as they can, you know, they, um, they feel like maybe they won't be able to walk as well once they start using a cane. So, you know, I, I guess probably the best thing you can do is just kind of be supportive and, and you know, let them know, um, you know, your concerns. And, you know, I, I just, I think about my daughter. I have a daughter who's 21 who has a mind of her own and doesn't always do the things that I think would be a good idea for her, would be good for her health or mental health. But, you know, all I can do is let her know how I feel and listen to her perspective on things. Sometimes if you listen to people's perspective on things, um, that's helpful. You know, it can help them to move forward. Good. But it's not easy. There's a, not an easy answer to that. It's a process a lot of times for people. My good friend Lynn, Lynn Og here, uh, commented on this. Harder on moms, as I think it looks like I'm struggling, when in fact I just do things differently, and it takes a long time. It's okay to let me struggle. And then he said, humility is key. We don't want to be obviously broken. Mm -hmm. Some good wisdom there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, humility is key. That's, um, that's hard for a lot of us, right? You know, um, but yeah, I mean, if we can be um, humble, if we can realize that we're all human and we're all vulnerable and we all have vulnerabilities, um, I think it's a lot easier for us to move forward. Yeah. And within that humility, you can find great strength. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to end it there because here, one second. I'm going to see if I can. One second, guys. There we go. Um, we're going to stop there. There's no other questions. And maybe as we're closing here, if somebody else does, I'll ask that. 
but we certainly wanted to say thank you again, Denise. This is a great this is a great topic, and it's one that's sensitive. That can be a little hard um, to deal with, but it's really necessary, and it's something that we're going to be talking about again next week. Um, it's going to be interactive. It's not going to be a webinar, so if you would like to join um, telephone only, or you can use your camera, but it is going to be more of a dialogue. I'll be hosting. Denise will be joining us, keeping us on the right path without going on too many rabbit trails. Um, but what we want to do here is to just continue the dialogue, and especially if someone's joining us today that is, you know, is struggling. This is something that um, my friends in the foundation. I love all my friends, you guys, and um, it's a journey. And it sounds like everybody's on the same path, but you know, the the emotions that go change day to day. And um, but we're all here for one another, and that is one of the biggest things. I can um, just tell tell you and share with you that that the foundation is here um, to support you and to encourage you and man to fulfill our mission of finding um, finding a treatment a cure um, no matter what stage we're at uh, and we're pushing hard for that um, but I just wanted to say you know thank you Denise thank you for coming everybody today we will continue to pursue this next week we'll send out some emails. Thanks to everybody that joined today, and uh, no other questions, so we'll end it there. Once again, I want to say thank you to Biogen and Allergan, who's our sponsors, and uh, good job, Denise. We'll see okay. you Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and I hope to um, talk to people more next week. Perfect. Perfect. See everyone then. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.